It began when my cat, Chester, went missing. There's no doubt in my mind that it began way before then, but I can only speak of what I've experienced. My name is Scott, and I'm a single dad, raising my daughter Molly alone. We just celebrated her first birthday. I'm a software engineer and I work from home these days. Anyway, this story is not about me. It's about my neighbour, and my cat. My next door neighbour, Mona Stuffington, used to be a striking figure. She was a young woman from Canada with a fit build and an attractive, confident smile. Rumour had it that she'd briefly worked in the adult film industry, and her YouTube channel banner did little to dispel those rumours. It showed her nude, surrounded by a grotesque display of food, hamburgers, steaks and fries, obscuring her naughty bits. Her vacant, soulless eyes and blank expression were unnerving. Mona's profession as a competitive eater seemed quite odd given her athletic physique, but over time, her appearance started to gradually change. Her face became puffy, as her skin became greasy and more pale. Deep lines formed around her nose and brow. Her hairline slowly receded, and her teeth appeared shorter and more discoloured. The most disturbing thing was how her mouth seemed to grow wider, and her eyes larger and bulging. She began to look less human, and more like something out of a nightmare. None of my neighbours seemed to notice anything different or unusual about Mona, but I found her altered appearance increasingly unsettling. When the COVID-19 lockdown started being enforced in my neighbourhood, our grocery store's hours were drastically cut. It was during this time that Mona began to occasionally knock on my door, asking for spare food. I barely knew her, but she seemed to have developed a fixation on me, on my child and on my cat. I had run into her in my building's mailroom as I carried Molly, and Mona's eyes would lock onto her with such an insane intensity that I thought she would attempt to grab her and run. I turned my body away from Mona, shielding my child from her hungry view. What a plump little turkey she is, Mona cooed creepily. One evening, as I was preparing dinner, Mona knocked again. When I opened the door, her grin was wider than ever, and her eyes were a sickly yellow. Do you have any... meat? She asked, her voice very raspy. No, I'm vegan, I said, trying to stay calm. I don't have anything for you. Her nonchalant gaze drifted over my shoulder to where Chester played happily with his fish toys. The look in her eyes made my skin crawl. It was a hunger so intense it felt predatory. I see, she said quietly. I told her that I had to go, and I closed the door quickly, feeling an icy chill. A week later, Chester was gone. I searched everywhere, called his name, and asked my neighbours, but there was no sign of him. Days turned into weeks, and there was still no trace. I didn't ask Mona about Chester's disappearance just yet, dreading what I might discover. Chester, an orange tabby, had always been an adventurous cat, coming and going through the sliding glass door of my second floor apartment. He'd always managed to return to my apartment by evening. Most of my neighbours liked him, and they knew that he belonged to me. They gave him a wide berth to do his thing and to roam freely around the apartment complex, without interference. Now he had vanished, and he was nowhere to be found. I sensed that Mona might have something to do with his disappearance, but I wasn't sure. The idea at first seemed preposterous. As the weeks went by, Mona's behaviour became more erratic. She rarely left her apartment, and when she did, her appearance had further deteriorated. Her face was swollen, red and dirty, and her eyes emitted an unsettling glimmer. I encountered her loitering in the apartment building's laundry room, and she freaked me out, I won't lie. A curtain of horseflies buzzed around her, she wore dirty clothes, and she smelled like dried poop. 
I tried, unsuccessfully, to dismiss my nervous reaction to her creepy and unexpected appearance. One night, I decided to confront Mona. I knocked on her door, and after a long pause, she answered, allowing hundreds of flies to escape. Her appearance was even more grotesque. Her face was severely bloated, and her eyes were unnaturally large and vacant. I need to know what happened to my cat, I demanded trying to steady my voice. Mona's smile widened, in a way that seemed almost inhuman. She stepped aside and waved me in. The interior was dark and filled with the stench of death, funk and decay. Her living room walls were covered in crude, weird symbols scrawled onto them with blunt tip black magic marker. There was rotten food and animal bones on her thick, crusty carpet, in the corner of her living room, there stood a small metal cage, covered with fecal-stained old newspapers. On the floor of this pen lay a piece of my cat's collar, unmistakable with its rainbow band and little fish charm. The sight made me sick to my stomach. Chester wasn't the only one. There were other collars, some old and grimy. As I stumbled back, something in the shadows of that room suddenly moved. A massive, bloated, misshapen figure that seemed to shift and writhe unnaturally. It drifted toward, and then, into Mona, making her look even more monstrous and formidable. I fled in terror, reporting everything to the authorities. I told the police exactly what I saw in Mona's dank apartment. I described seeing Chester's broken, discarded collar. I also mentioned seeing the grotesque, supernatural being. The police searched her apartment, but Mona had vanished. Mona's disappearance was never solved. Some thought she had fled the country, while others feared that she was hiding nearby. The investigation provided some closure, but the evil of what I had witnessed never left me. I moved my daughter to a new apartment, hoping to leave the past behind, but my nightmares persisted. While unpacking old boxes, I found a journal I had kept during that time. It was filled with sketches and notes about Mona's disturbing transformation and the horror I had seen. The last entry was chilling. A sketch of Mona, with the title, Beelzebub. The drawing depicted a grotesque, bloated figure, surrounded by dark symbols. I closed the journal, shivering. Mona's YouTube channel had gone silent, as if she had vanished from the face of the earth. But sometimes, in the dead of night, I hear a faint knocking on my door, followed by a rasping voice asking for something I can't give. The unsettling idea that something so horrific and malevolent is still out there, feeding on innocent creatures, keeps me awake. It's only a matter of time before it moves on to larger prey.